Yeah, I did not. I didn't know I was a boy. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome all of you here this morning. I am uh, having my third cold of the school year, so I don't know what that's about, but uh, just bear with me if you would on uh, things today. Um, so we've got Lesson 83 today, the Early Dispensational Witness of Ironside, Part 2. Last study, we began looking at uh, the Mysteries of God, written by Ironside in 1908. Okay? And we, uh, we looked at some things about this book in general. We talked a little bit about, we gave some, a few biographical points about Ironside in general. And then we started to uh, dissect the dispensational teaching that he puts forth in The Mysteries of God, written in 1908. Now, we did not finish that. So this is what I want to resume with uh, here this morning, is to continue with looking at uh, what it is that Ironside teaches with respect to dispensational truth in the 1908 book. Now, a few points of summary, okay? We saw last time that he clearly identifies the difference between prophecy and mystery. We saw that Ironside clearly understood that God had a plan uh, in the earth with respect to the nation of Israel and a plan for the secret plan for the heavens with respect to the church, the body of Christ. That, that was not part of or spoken of in the Old Testament. We looked at the fact that he... Uh, understands that Christ came in his earthly ministry to be the king of the nation of Israel and that's different from his ministry as head of the church the body of Christ uh, uh, some of the issues that we discussed are the chapter <clears throat> where he talks about the parables uh, of the mysteries of God that was the only chapter that we said was uh, was weak and other than a few other points in this a lot of the material that's presented in this book is is in line with what we would understand to be a mid acts interpretation of the scriptures. Um, in fact, I believe it was Mike even pointed out that a lot of this is reminiscent of things that O'Hare has to say later. Uh, so we're going to continue now looking at this book. And the chapter that I want to consider next is uh, chapter 8, which is titled The Mystery of the Rapture of the Saints. So again, this is coming from the 1908 book, 1908 book The Mysteries of God. Chapter 8 begins with another clear statement regarding Pauline truth and the revelation of the mystery. Quote, to the epistles of Paul alone do we turn for the revelation of the mystery. He was the special vessel chosen to make known the heavenly calling. The twelve were, as we have seen, connected primarily, primarily with the testimony to Israel. Paul, as one born out of due time, was selected to be the messenger to the nations, announcing the distinctive truths of the present dispensation. Again, I read that statement and I think any, any major uh, mid thinker could have written a statement like that. Uh, whether it be O'Hare or Stam or anybody, uh, Baker, anybody could have written a statement like that and said it as clearly and succinctly as Mr. Ironside did. However, if you look at the next quote, here's where we still see Mr. Ironside holding on to his, his Plymouth Brethrenism and Acts 2 officially as the beginning of the church. So we should read this statement too. First then, let it be noted that Old Testament prophecy never refers to the dispensation in which we live, extending from Pentecost to the Lord's coming for His own. So Ironside clearly identifies that the current dispensation started where? That's Pentecost. Now I find, again, I find this to be baffling in the writings of a lot of these men. Because read the sentence that comes before the parentheses. First, then, let it be noted that Old Testament prophecy never refers to the dispensation in which we live. Go to Acts 2 quick in your Bible. Go to Acts chapter 2. All you have to do is read Acts 2 to know that the events in Acts 2 are, in fact, the fulfillment of what? Prophecy. So I don't understand. I mean, on one hand, I don't understand totally why there's this dogmatic commitment to Acts 2 has to be the beginning of the church other than simply it's a dispensational tradition. Because if you read Acts 2, it doesn't even match what Mr. Ironside says in his statement before the parenthesis there in that sentence. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse uh, uh, 15. These are not drunken as you suppose, seeing as it is but the third hour of the day. And look at verse 16 is explicitly clear. Okay. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter says in no uncertain terms that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost is in fact the beginning 
of Joel, the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. Okay? So with that in mind, go back and read, please, the sentence from the uh, quote from Ironside. <coughs> First then, let it be noted that Old Testament prophecy never refers to the dispensation in which we live. Extending from Pentecost to the Lord's coming, save in a most indefinite way. As for instance, in Daniel 9.26, a passage which will come before us a little further down, from Moses to Malachi, Scripture is mainly occupied with one nation, Israel. And the hope of that nation, namely the rising up of the prophet, priest, who is to bring into everlasting blessing as a people, though not until their regeneration. The Gentiles shall share in that blessing, but not as on the same footing with Israel, rather in subjection to them. The prophetic clock, as noted before, stopped at Calvary. It will not start again till the fullest of the Gentiles be come in. The, uh, the present is a timeless epic, parenthetically introduced between the 69th and 70th weeks. Now, I agree with them about that. I just don't agree with them about where the church starts, okay? But I agree that the church is inserted between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel. Anyway, back to the quote. The present is a timeless epic parenthetically introduced between the 69th and 70th weeks in which God is taking out from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Not that he, was, uh, not that he has utterly given, given up the Jew now, but both Jew and Gentile stand on one footing. There is no difference, for all have sinned. Both alike are saved through faith in Christ, and all such are made members of, of the one body, the church, by the Holy Ghost unified to Christ as uh, Christ Jesus as head in heaven, according to the revelation of the mystery which we have already considered. The church began with the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. How long will it exist on earth? Will, uh, will, remain, will it remain here throughout the time of Jacob's trouble and until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled? Now, so a couple things there in my opinion. I think almost everything he says there is pretty much on point except for saying that the church and body of Christ starts where? In Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. So if you look at my point underneath that quote, despite the obvious references to the church beginning in Acts 2, most mid-Acts dispensationalists would agree with the general order of events laid out by Ironside. The dispensation of grace, of grace was parenthetically inserted into the sentence of prophecy between the end of the 69th and the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. <laughs> With respect to the final question, raised by Ironside in the passage quoted above, will it, referring to the church, remain here, that is, on earth, through the time of Jacob's trouble and until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled? Ironside answers with an emphatic no. Ironside believed that another mystery was revealed to Paul, dealing with the close of the current dispensation of grace. Quote, Scripture answers no. Another mystery was made known to the Apostle Paul, declaring the close of the church's history by a mighty miracle which may take place at any moment. This is the proper hope of the Christian. Uh, and it is this uh, marvelous event with, uh, which marks the fullness of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles will not end until the tribulation period is over, which begins upon the rapture of the church. The church has no part in, the time of, in, in that time of trouble. It belongs to heaven and will be taken home to glory ere it, ere it begins. I would note briefly the characteristics of that period of judgment. It will, be a, it will be a short dispensation in which divine wrath will be poured out upon Israel, apostate Christendom, and the nations at large. This is the great tribulation. But we search in vain for any mention of the church or the heavenly saints on earth during that fearful time. No, they are above it all, with the Lamb who redeemed them, and who shall have taken them to be with himself. So, does Mr. Ironside here clearly teach a pre-tribulational rapture of the saints? Okay? And he says that that also is a mystery, that that is a further aspect of the mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. But you can't find that anywhere other than in the writings of the Apostle Paul. The Grace History Project, that's me, agrees with Brother Ironside that the rapture slash catching away of the saints to meet the Lord in the air is the hope of the church. We must, however, respectfully disagree with Mr. Ironside in one detail with respect to the event. The only saints that are resurrected to meet the Lord in the air, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, are members of the body of Christ from the current dispensation of grace. Ironside taught that saints from previous generations would also take part in this unprophesied event. Quote, 
This is the mystery of the rapture. The shout of the Lord will awaken all the sleeping church. The voice of the archangel Michael, who, Michael, who is the prince of Israel, will summon the saints of bygone dispensations from their tombs. The trump of God will sound, the last trump of 1 Corinthians 15.52, closing up this dispensation, and in a moment all the redeemed, whether raised or changed, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So, in the details of what Mr. Einstein says, I personally do not think that the saints of previous, of, of, of kingdom dispensations, as it were, previous dispensations, are going to participate in the, in the event we call the catching away or the rapture. Mr. Ironside said that they did. Okay? So, there's a, there's a technicality there that I would not agree with him about. But in the general sense, he does not have the church passing through the tribulation. He has the, the rapture occurring before the time of Jacob's trouble. And he does not have any of the church, the body of Christ, on earth during that time period that prophecy identifies as the time of Jacob's trouble. So, any questions or comments about his thoughts about the rapture? When are the previous saints going to be? I think they're resurrected before the kingdom. At the end of the tribulation, there's an event called the first resurrection. And I believe it's at that point that all of the righteous dead of Israel are resurrected to go into the kingdom. Chapter 8, the mystery of lawlessness. In chapter 8, Ironside addresses the subject of the mystery of iniquity. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Why don't you turn there quick? Go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. You should probably read this verse. Um, <coughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So Paul says that whatever this mystery of iniquity is, is already what? It's already working during the, the during the uh, dispensation of grace. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the mystery of iniquity, according to the Apostle Paul here, is already at work. There's something, though, that is restraining, letting, hindering, or holding back the full onset of what he's talking about here. So let's look at what Mr. Ironside said about this. So he, he, uh, it said, in chapter 8, Ironside addresses the subject of the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. An analysis of his thoughts concerning the subject is both impressive and instructive. Simply stated, Ironside believed that God revealed the, that when God revealed the mystery concerning the body of Christ, <coughs> Satan responded by changing the way he operated. Quote, Far otherwise, even in his own days, when Christianity was but in its infancy, the apostle wrote, The mystery of lawlessness, iniquity in the King James Bible, doth, are, doth already work. And that, and that effectually, for as the last word applies in the original, side by side with the proclamation of the truth, as it has ever been the satanic work, energetically carried on to corrupt the truth, introducing poisonous counterfeits, that delude the souls of all who receive them. Invariably, Satan works by imitation. God has revealed holy mysteries to his servants. The devil, too, must have his deep things, which thus appear to be to, which thus appear to the spiritually proud and carnally minded. The mystery of lawlessness is, in fact, the working of the human mind energized by Satan in divine things, refusing the sure testimonies of the Lord and walking in vain confidence, the ear is, is readily given to fables, and the mind reveals, uh, uh, revels, sorry, in wonderful and strange teachings which delight and bewilder, but are not, but are, but are not only to no profit, but to the actual subverting of those who run greedily after them. The object of Satan is to turn the eye from Christ. Hence, the mystery of lawlessness makes much of man and by means whatever puts the Lord Jesus Christ at a distance. So, I don't know, you can agree or disagree with him, but whether you agree or disagree, his thoughts on this are definitely interesting. 
What he's essentially saying is that when God revealed the mystery of the church, Satan responded to that in a fashion by um, adjusting his operations, adjusting his, his sort of tactics to counter what, what God was now doing through the revelation of the mystery and through the formation of the church, the body of Christ. According to either side, the goal of the mystery of iniquity is to obscure the truth of the mystery from the minds of Christians. This is done by causing believers to sink down to the level of the world rather than keeping their affections on things above. Quote, <clears throat> in its earliest inception, this mystery consisted in taking up the hopes, forms, and ceremonies of the Jewish dispensation and transferring them generally, or sorry, gradually to the church of the present period. This accomplished, the heavenly calling would be lost sight of. The great mystery of Christ and the church would be effectually hidden, and believers thus sink down to the level of the world, becoming in spirit dwellers on the earth, and forgetting that their, and I believe this word is translated citizenship, uh, is in heaven. Hence, hence uh, we soon see that the truth of the priesthood of all believers, each one having intimate access to God, displaced by the teaching, that as in Judaism and in heathenism, so now there is a special priestly order who alone have to, have to do directly with the mystery of religion and now act as mediators and go-betweens for the laity or the... the uh, Commonality. Thank you. <laughs> this, this was one of Satan's most coming devices to put the people at a distance from God. How well it has succeeded the centuries witness. By degrees, more and more power with its accompanying company pop, pop, sorry, was delegated to this superior hierarchy. Uh, gorgeous vestments were adopted, magnificent titles accorded, and thus the simple Christianity of earlier days seems almost crushed out of existence. Now again, I find a lot in that statement that I find to be true. Okay? I think that's... I think it's pretty much accurate. I, I don't see much of it that I, that I would take issue with or disagree with. Um, he definitely is saying that Satan has attacked the truth of the mystery. And the way he's attacked it is to confuse people and to get them functioning like they're Israel. And to establish a, 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 a system of go-betweens and a hierarchical structure that separates God from, the, from what is called the laity or the common people. And he says that this is all part of the mystery of iniquity, and this is the way that Satan has attacked the revelation of the mystery by A, getting people to function like they're Israel, B, to adopt a priest, priestly order and say that this is the way that, um, that, that it's functioned and that these, this priestly order ministers the, the, quote, mysteries of religion. So again, I find a lot of things here with what Ironside says that, that, are, that is accurate, okay? We'll take questions on this section when we're done with it. While the mystery of iniquity is already working, the presence of the church on earth is hindering its full onset. Once the rapture occurs, the church is removed. The mystery of iniquity will be allowed to run its course. It will ultimately culminate with the worship of Satan himself, according to Ironside. Quote, Suffice it to say that so effectual has been the working of this mystery of lawlessness that there remains not one doctrine of Scripture that has not been denied and an imitation foisted upon the ignorant in its place. Thus it went on spreading, not only through the Roman communion, but also among so-called Greek Orthodox, and now among Anglican and even Protestant denominations, as well as heretical sects like Christian science, New Thought, etc. But it has not yet attained its full growth, nor nor will it while the church indwelt by the Holy Spirit remains upon the earth. In 2 Thessalonians 2, we read of a hindrance of the full manifestation of the evil of the mystery of lawlessness referred to, which is evidently the presence of the Holy Ghost in the church on earth. He lets or hinders <coughs> until he be taken out of the way. When the church will be gone, the secret, the secret of iniquity will be will be headed up in one man, the Antichrist of prophecy. And all who had chosen the earth in place of the heavenly portion will be given over to strong delusion. Thus shall Babylon's power be broken, and all worship and homage be paid to a man, the man of sin, 
who heads up in himself the mystery of lawlessness. This is the subject of the 13th chapter of Revelation, which in point of time seems to be subsequent to chapter 17. For there we see no woman riding the beast. Her doom has already come, and now the man of sin is fully revealed, and all pay homage to the Antichrist, the false messiah. This is the devil's masterpiece and the culmination of the mystery which he has been developing for so long. But his triumph shall be but momentary, for when iniquity is at its height and Satan's power seems to be supreme, the heavens shall be opened and he shall ride forth whom John saw in vision as described in chapter 19 of the same book. So, I mean, Mr. Einstein speaks for himself in my opinion as to what he's got to say here. Um, I don't find anything written necessarily in the comments that, that the average mid ex dispensationalist is going to object to with respect to what he's, what he's talking about here with the mystery of iniquity. Any questions or comments about this chapter? He seems to understand and think that we are functioning as a kingdom or as a, a priesthood of the believer. Yeah. I, yep. I think we're like, we function like it, we're a priesthood. He thinks that, he definitely says that this that, that the believer can go to God himself yeah. and does not need this whole structure of intermediaries and go-betweens between him and God, that the believer has direct access to God through faith in Christ. Um, that's the way I, again, the way I understand what he's saying. Now, there are more chapters in this book, okay? But I had to cut it off somewhere, all right? So the other chapters in this book, I don't mean to say that they're not good chapters. They're fine chapters, but they don't really bring forth much more as far as that will further our understanding beyond what he's already said. So I want to look at some concluding thoughts on the mysteries of God. The Grace History Project acknowledges that the mysteries of God is not totally a mid-act work. Ironside clearly thinks that the body of Christ began on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. However, the work does contain many points that are consistent with the mid-Acts view. When one considers the timing of the publication in 1908, on the eve of the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible, and the same year as a conversation between Charles Welch and Bollinger, the mysteries of God is truly unique. First, it has more in common with the mid-Acts view than does the Schofield Reference Bible. Second, that does not exhibit the excesses of the Acts 28 view that, that was developing in Great Britain at the same time. So, the mysteries of God shares the following views in common with the mid-Acts position. Number one, clear distinction between prophecy and mystery. Number two, Israel's king, Israel's king and kingdom is the subject of prophecy that deals with God's dealings in the earth. It's kind of repetitive to say deals there twice, so I might want to change that, but you get the point. The church was a mystery pertaining to the secret plan and purpose of God concerning the heavenly places. Fourth, the reasons the church is so confused today, and that the word of God uh, are sorry that the word of God has not been rightly divided between these two purposes of God. Fifth, Roman Catholicism has sought to obscure the truth of the mystery by using the term to refer to her sacramental system. Next, the unbelief of Israel and her rejection of king and kingdom is what has wrought out the revelation of God's secret plan and purpose concerning the body of Christ. When the Gentiles abuse the grace of God as Israel did, they will be cut off and God will resume and finish his dealings with Israel. Next, the mystery was a unique Pauline revelation completely unknown in Scripture before it was revealed to Paul. Furthermore, the revelation of the mystery fulfilled or completed the Word of God. So this is summarizing last week and this week. The catching way of the church to meet the Lord in the air will end the current dispensation of grace. This, this even was part of the revelation of the mystery and completely unknown before the time of Paul. And last... Satan has attacked the revelation of the mystery through the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity has sought to obscure the truth of the heavenly calling and purpose of the body of Christ by trying to get the church to think and function like Israel. Presently, the church, the church, the body of Christ on earth is hindering the full onset of the mystery of iniquity. 
Once the body is taken out of the way, i.e. raptured, the mystery of iniquity will proceed unabated uh, to the worship of the Antichrist. So all of those points are found within the mysteries of God written in 1908, and all of them are, I would say, almost universally agreed upon by anybody that would identify themselves as a mid-ex dispensationalist. Now, and again, all of that is written in this book that dates from 1908. We cannot obviously say that he definitely is mid-acts because that's going too far. So my point here is just to say that there's much in this book that is in line with what was later going to be taught by men who we would identify as being mid-acts in their dispensational perspective. Okay. Now, before we move on to look at the second book, are there any final questions or comments about the mysteries of God? No? Okay. All right. Because you did such an excellent job. I hope so. Hopefully it's not because you're all sleeping. Okay. Now, the second book by Ironside that I want to spend a little bit of time, time considering is this book, Sailing with Paul. Simple Papers for Young Christians. Okay? This one is written in 1913. So this was written a few years later. But uh, there are some, and this is, it, the title of this book is very accurate. <coughs> These are just short, maybe two and a half, three, no more than four page little essays on different aspects of uh, Pauline truth. Okay, if, if you haven't looked at it, it's definitely worth, worth looking at. But this book dates from 1913. So if you look at your notes, written in 1913, Ironside Sailing with Paul also contains some historically significant information with respect to the development of dispensational truth. As the title suggests, this work contains 18 short papers on various aspects of what it means to sail with Paul in the Christian life. In this work, Ironside challenges his reader to give heed to Pauline authority in their Christian lives. Now, this is unique. What he does here is he says, if you're going to be a true believer, if you're going to be an established believer, you've got to pay attention to Paul. Okay, now look at what he says here. Uh, regarding Luke's account of Paul's voyage to Rome, recorded in the book of Acts, Ironside asks his readers the following, quote, Do you sail with Paul? <coughs> Sorry. It is not now a question of temporal, but of eternal salvation. The voyage I have in mind is not from one earthly port to another, but the vastly more important voyage from earth to heaven, from the city of destruction to the celestial city. One thing is certain, you are on a voyage, sailing over the sea of time bound for eternity. Do you sail with Paul? All who do so reach the port of endless glory at last, whatever vicissitudes they may pass through on the voyage. All who do not sail with the great apostle to the nations will fail of final salvation. Let their hopes be never so high as their passage never so calm and peaceful. What is it to sail with Paul? It is to know Paul's Savior and to share Paul's blessings. Are these things true of you? There are untold thousands in Christendom today who are nominal believers, who belong to the church in its outward respect, who partake of the sacraments and are more or less zealous in what is called Christian work, but who do not sail with Paul. He repudiated all such things as a ground of confidence and trusted alone in the matchless grace of God. Pretty good uh, opening. Yeah. <coughs> Time and space will not, permit, will not permit an exhaustive analysis of sailing with Paul. So we will limit our comments to only those areas that are most reflective of Pauline truth. <coughs> In each of the following sections, the italicized title corresponds with a chapter from the book, followed by some summary quotations from that chapter. So, please note that every chapter... That's not right. I should say, please note that every chapter is not discussed. Because they're all not discussed. So, the first chapter, conversion to God. This is what he said about that subject. Let me back up, though, before we get into this. Is, is he saying that if you want to get to heaven, you've got to follow the teachings of the Apostle Paul? Yes. Yep. 
He seems to be saying that in the introduction. Okay? So let's read what else he says. Conversion to God. He who sails with Paul has been truly and definitely converted to God. Conversion is a turning from self to Christ. It is a ceasing to rely on one's own fancied merits and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Remember, it is, remember, it is not the right faith that saves, but faith in the right person. You might, have the strongest, you might have the strongest possible faith in yourself, in the priest, in the church, in the sacraments, in visions or dreams, and be lost forever. But on the other hand, the feeblest faith in Christ Jesus, God's Lamb, saves for all eternity and puts you forever in Paul's company. Let nothing make you doubt that you are converted and therefore eternally saved. If Christ is the one to whom you have turned for deliverance. Pretty good. Next chapter, forgiveness of sins. And again, if you have a question or comment, certainly raise your hand and we'll uh, discuss it. <coughs> forgiveness of sins. No unforgiven soul sails with Paul. Which is to say that Scripture recognizes no such person as a believer in Christ Jesus who has not already received forgiveness of all his sins. The word feel does not belong to the Christian. You see, it does not belong to the Christian, you see, but to the heathen who have no written revelation. Our word is faith or believe. We do not know because we feel, but we believe God's word and thus we know. We read in Scripture the witness of the Spirit to us and the, witness, and the witness in us. Until we receive the witness to us, we cannot have the witness in us. This is of supreme importance, and I hope will be carefully noted. The Spirit's witness is not a happy feeling in my heart. It is the record of the Word of God as to the work of Christ and its results. Amen. I really like that one. Okay. Um, again, some of these chapters in here are just, are just really, really good to read. They're very clear, they're very simple, they're very straight to the point, and the, dot, and the things that he's communicating in, in them are absolutely correct. Then he talks about, uh, then he's got another chapter called Justification of, uh, from All Things, which we're going to be talking about this morning in church. <coughs> the just shall live by faith. It remained for the apostle of the Gentiles to fully develop and uh, widely proclaimed the great doctrine of justification by faith. It is the cornerstone of the mystery of the gospel. No other apostle or apostolic writer uh, so much as mentions it, save Luke, as the inspired historian tells us how Paul preached it. So he says that nobody, no other writer mentions the mystery of the gospel except Luke, and even when Luke mentions it, Luke is only mentioning it to tell us that Paul did what? That Paul preached it. Okay? Uh, it, is, uh, it is the sentence of the judge in favor of the prisoner. And yet it is the ungodly who are justified by a holy God on the principles of absolute righteousness. How can such an event be brought about? The Lord Jesus himself has taken the place of the guilty born the judgment due to sin, and having fully glorified God to disrespect, has been raised from the dead and seated in highest glory as man, in token of God's full uh, satisfaction in His finished work. It is, it is very simplicity of it over, it is the very simplicity of it over which men stumble. That He, the Holy One, should have been made a sin offering that we might become the righteousness of God and Him is something mere human reason would never have conceived. Yet this is the very pith and marrow of the gospel. Sin is not merely pardoned, it is atoned for. Guilt is not simply overlooked, it is gone forever from the eye of God in the cross of His Son. Iniquity is not only forgiven, it is purged by the blood of, his, by the, blood of the Son of the Highest, and the transgressor is justified from all things. He himself took the condemnation, endured the wrath of God, and has made full satisfaction for the believer's sin. 
Faith rests on this and fears no more. That's a great chapter. Okay? That's, that's excellent. So again, any questions or comments, make sure you uh, let me know, because otherwise we might be actually done early here. So hopefully you oh. all. It is true, you know, about the oversimplification of it. Well, people don't get it because it's just so simple. That's just, that's just too easy. You know? <laughs> that's, Look, whatever Ironside, whatever Ironside does later in his ministry, which we will talk about, okay, when you read this early stuff, here's a guy that's advocating, in my opinion, for Pauline authority. Okay, He's saying that if you want to be saved, you've got to say it with Paul. He's saying if you're going to understand justification, you're going to learn it from who? Paul. And he's saying that it is in the Pauline revelation that these things are communicated to the believer. And you know, he even says, like we just read, that nowhere else do you read about this. The only other biblical writer that mentions it is Luke, and the only reason Luke mentions it is to record for history that Paul said it. Okay? Regeneration. <coughs> so these none of these chapters, by the way, are numbers. They're just, they just all have a title on them. They're not, they're not numbered chapters. Regeneration. God not only clears the believer from every charge forgiving his sins and justifying him from all things. But he makes him a new creature, giving him a new nature and introducing him into a new creation of which the risen Christ is the head. Paul never speaks of being born again, though he uses other terms that mean practically the same thing. He looks at man as dead and needing life. So he says to believers, when we were dead in sins, we were quickened together with Christ, Ephesians 2.5. We have become sharers of Christ's life. Hence, we are born from above, and now we belong to the new creation of which Christ is the head. Once, once in the new creation, I am in Christ and can never again be separated from Him. Does he understand eternal security? He does. He does. Based on that statement, he does. Okay? Hey, this a lot of the stuff he's talking about here sounds a lot like what we've been preaching on lately about the things freely given to us of God. Because what he's talking about here is who, who the believer's been made in Jesus Christ. And again, you don't learn that in the Gospels. You don't learn that anywhere else in the Bible but through the message and writings of the Apostle Paul. Then he's got this fascinating chapter here about acceptance. Okay? He says, It is a precious truth that God accepts every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not according to any real or fancied goodness in himself, but according to the Father's estimate of his beloved Son. And being thus brought so near to God in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, our security naturally follows. We are in him, and consequently, as safe from judgment as he is. He died in our stead, and faith reckons his death as our death. Now he lives forever beyond the reach of death and judgment, and in him we are accepted. If he, if he falls, then do we also fall. But he, but he has said, because I live, ye shall, ye shall live also. We have, we have died out of the old relationship in which we had been part by nature. But we have now been raised with Christ, and our life is here with Christ in God. But let it never be forgotten. No merit attaches to the believer because of his godliness or devotedness. He needs none. He is already accepted in the beloved. And nothing can be added to this. No loving obedience can... Rent, uh, can sorry. No loving... Yes, obedience he can render can make him one whit dearer to the heart of God. Could you just go with me to flip Ephesians 1. What Ironside is talking about is Ephesians 1, 5, no, 1, 6. Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, where He hath made us accepted in the beloved. I decided to talking about, here's who you are. You're accepted in Jesus Christ. You can't, nothing you can do can add one thing to what He's already done for you in terms of accepting you, is what Einstein is saying here. 
Any questions or comments? The assembly as the body of Christ. <laughs> now I should tell you, um, just as an aside, that there are some areas in here that, that, that I do uh, take issue with. Um, and one of them is he does teach the idea of short accounts forgiveness. Um, he teaches that your position in Christ is secure, but that your fellowship with Christ can be affected by when you sin. And what you have to do then is to confess your sin to, you know, be to have that fellowship restored. Um, so as good as he is in some of these comments, he is, in my opinion, unclear about other aspects of uh, some of these things with respect to practical forgiveness. Uh, if you talk, if you, um, I'm actually going to be preaching on this as part of the series we're doing in church about uh, 1 John 1, 9 and some of these issues, but he does teach that practically you should confess your sins to restore fellowship with God. And I personally, as I know some of you, don't, don't accept that as being uh, a something that the believer needs to do and so on, or that that's even what 1 John 1, 9 is even talking about, because I don't believe that it is. So there are a few things that he does say in here that are not quite right in my opinion. The stuff that I've got here is the best stuff out of what he has to say. And this, where, where, let me put it this way. When, when he's right, he's right. Okay? The assembly as the body of Christ. At the time of his conversion on the Damascus Turnpike, the germ of a great truth was revealed to Paul, which later became the chiefest in the galaxy of doctrines which it was his mission and apostle to make known for the obedience of faith. But this doctrine of the one body is never referred to by any other apostle than Paul. He calls it the dispensation of the mystery, which he had, a, which he had been especially entrusted with. Indeed, it was the characteristic truth of a large and varied ministry, the truth of Jew and Gentile being formed by the Spirit into one body upon being born of God. Excuse me. And by the same Spirit, linked up to Christ as the head in heaven, was a truth, was a truth never before made known. The Old Testament will be searched in vain for it. It is not there because it was hidden God. It was the secret purpose of his heart only to be revealed after the rejection of his son. It actually became a fact when the Holy Spirit was given on Pentecost, though until the special revelation given to Paul, it was not seen that, it, that this involved membership in the body of Christ. Now, I want to stop there for a second. That's a, that's a standard Acts 2 interpretation. Okay? That it started on, Acts, on the day of Pentecost and that nobody knew about it okay, until he tells it to Paul. So when he tells it to Paul, he's talking to Paul about something that had already started back in Acts 2. This is a standard, uh, a great many Acts 2 dispensationalists handle this information in this way. Okay? Um, this is essentially, if you remember back to last year when we were talk, talking about Darby and Trotter, this was basically the same argument that those men were making, and it's the same argument that many will still make in, in our day. And that was... <laughs> Men like Walton and uh, Pastor Reed, one of the old time Christians, they, they called it uh, the body of Christ in Acts 2 was in embryo form, whatever that means. Yeah. It was another way of trying to explain that. Yeah. So I, my point is stopping there is just to tell you that that's what, to highlight that that's what Ironside is saying here. The, fa the fact existed prior to the knowledge of it is the idea here, as the next sentence says. Now every saint, now every saint should have clear light as to it, because it is everywhere declared or taken for granted in whose epistles? Paul's epistles. The last section to consider here is what he says about baptism and connected truths. <coughs> and we mentioned a little bit of this last Sunday. Just somebody asked about it. I don't remember who it was. But he says, baptism is the inter initi initiatory ordinance of Christianity. It expresses subjection to the Lordship of Christ. 
to fritter away what God has said concerning this beautifully expressive ordinance as some do today on the plea that it did not belong to the special revelation given to Paul and consequently had no place in the dispensation of the mystery is to ignore or pervert what our apostle has himself left on record regarding it. Now, when you read that, the first question you should ask yourself, you should acknowledge that that Ironside wrote this book in 1913. Okay? So the next question you should ask yourself is who is saying that baptism is not for the dispensation of grace previous to 1913? It's not O'Hare. It's not Stan. It's not Baker. These men's ministries really haven't even started yet. Okay? As of 1913. So who do we already know is out there and in print arguing that the dispensation of grace, that water baptism should not be practiced during the dispensation of grace. The only person that I can think of that would be actually saying and making that argument clearly would have been Mr. Bullinger and Mr. Welch. Now, there may have been others that I'm not aware of, which is highly possible and in fact may even be probable, okay? But when he he's clearly has in mind when he make when he makes that statement he is clearly referring to some people who were teaching that water baptism does not have a place for the church in the dispensation of grace. Okay, so let's read the next point <coughs> where I kind of summarize this. When one considers the last statement regarding baptism, it is important to keep in mind that it was made in 1913. This is this is before the time of O'Hare, Stan, and Baltimore, the early champions of Pauli Max dispensationalism in the United States. One should ask, of whom is Ironside speaking? Who was out there teaching no water baptism prior to 1913? From the standpoint of the Grace History Project, there are only two potential answers to this question, E.W. Bollinger and Charles Welch. Not only were these men teaching that water baptism is not for today, but they were also using the exact verbiage, dispensation of the mystery, in their writings. Okay? Now, I'm sure, because this is the way the study has gone, that given enough time, somebody's going to produce a document that clearly teaches no water baptism other than, or before 1913, that was not written by Mr. Bollinger or Mr. Welch. But for now, using common sense, it seems that, well, not just common sense, we know and we've already seen that those two men are already out there saying this. Okay? Yeah, no. Are there any, <clears throat> I don't know if there's anything in the, that early that would show that the Friends of the Quakers uh, didn't have water baptism, that there were certain offshoots that, uh, that preached that there was no need for it. If they, were, if they were saying that, they were not saying it based on that logic. Because the logic that he's expressing here is dispensationally specific logic um, that is very technical. Yeah. When Norm saying that just made me remember this. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, I worked for a short time for the Salvation Army. Um, I was the secretary to their their top um, officer in the Grand Rapids area. And um, that was the first time I had ever met a group of believers who did not practice water baptism. Um, and I know that Ironside was part of the Salvation Army, so I wonder if he was even referring to me. Were they already not practicing water baptism back that early? It's a good question. I don't know the exact answer. The reason I said what I said here, though, in this statement is, again, because of the, 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 the dispensationally specific <clears throat> nature of his reasoning. And even if the Salvation Army had already stopped doing water baptism, I don't think they're going to make this exact argument that he seems to be refuting. No, no, their logic was good. Okay. Their logic is not the same, which tells me that he is referring to a specific dispensational understanding that's out there previous to 1913. Yeah, Craig. When in, in, in your first paragraph there, he says it, it is to ignore or pervert what our apostle <coughs> has himself left on record. Is he putting water in like Romans <coughs> and stuff like that? Cause... Uh, 
Uh, let me see here. Where did I leave off? It says it's page 54. He says, now look, I, I, maybe I cut the quote off too soon, and when I, before we put this on the internet, I might want to add a few more lines, because now that I look at it more, I, I may have wanted to do this. So if you look at what's in your, in your notes, these, the last sentence that you have there at the top of page 8 ends, uh, it is to ignore, to pervert what the apostle have, has himself left on record regarding it. Then the next, very next sentence says, it is true that he was not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, again, who's, who's using that verse to make the argument that water baptism has no place in the dispensation of grace, but a somebody that understands something about some form of Pauline dispensationalism? But anyway, he says, It is true that he was not sent to baptize, but to preach. If people make more of the servant than they should, uh, he was thankful he had baptized none, save a very few, lest any should be baptized in his own name. Nevertheless, he did, in italics, baptize, and when for good and sufficient reasons he did not administer the ordinance himself, he saw that someone else, some one of his fellow laborers, did so. Now, I don't know how he's going to prove that, okay? Now, i got a book on my shelf that we're going to talk about in a few weeks, written by a guy that says that early on, that... Ironside maintained a relationship with Mr. O'Hare by refusing to, per, to baptize anyone himself, then he would have his surrogates do it. Well, I've heard people say that before because they say that's what Christ did. Christ didn't baptize himself. Christ. But I have it on document, I have it in, in writing that, that this is that early on in the, in the late 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s, that O'Hare and, and Ironside were able to sort of maintain a relationship for a while because. Or Ironside refused to baptize anybody himself, and he would uh, have his, you know, assistants or whatever you want to call them baptized. Um, this is too long, Craig, for me to read the whole thing because it's like six pages. But if you want to read the rest of it, you should uh, access it. But he does talk about Romans six. Um, I don't think that he says that it's, it's water in Romans six. He, he clearly, if he does that, he's clearly undermining what he already said in the book. Um, but he does say that water baptism should be being practiced uh, during the dispensation of grace. So if you look at the last point, and then we'll take any question, final questions you might have. Once again, an evaluation of Salem with Paul reveals that it is not totally consistent with the mid acts dispensational perspective. However, the book does teach many great truths with which most mid acts dispensationalists would agree. Unfortunately, as we have seen, unfortunately, as we will see in future lessons, Ironside changed his mind on some of these doctrines later in his ministry. So, are there any other questions, comments, with respect to the early dispensational witness of Ironside, please? And just a comment in passing. Uh, Pre-Ironside was Moody. And in that book uh, called uh, Passion for Souls, which is an autobiography, where he, <coughs> he refused water baptism. Uh, he was never baptized. He refused to be called anything but Mr. Moody. Uh, he had no such thing as ordination. Uh, I do know that Arasanke was an active member in the Grace Church out at Montauk Point, which is still active today, there on Long Island. So there must have been some connection there. Uh, I do also know that the first man that Moody, in fact, as Pastor Stan makes an issue of this, the first man that Moody appointed to the Institute was Williams. Uh, Williams' commentary, who, in my opinion, was an Acts 28 believer. So there's got to be some de 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 dis uh, dissemination of what we would call at least a, a, a grace truth. Dispensational grace, true. Uh, the other, I don't want to challenge you on this. This is not an argument, except that there in your uh, on acceptance, uh, last uh, paragraph or last uh, two sentences. Uh, he needs none. He is already accepted in the blood, beloved. Nothing can be added to this. Loving obedience can. Uh, uh, 
he can render can make him one whit dearer to the heart of God. I agree with that 100%. However, uh, how would we, uh, how would we uh, place his comment, Paul's comment, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where he says, uh, Wherefore, whether absent or present with the Lord, wherefore we labor, that whether we are present or absent, we may be accepted in him. So there seems to be a practical acceptance other than a judicial acceptance. Uh, something beyond salvation here and acceptance in the Christian life. That's just a comment, not an argument. Okay. Uh, I don't think he, again, quoting from the, the booklet, I don't think he touches on that issue. He does have a chapter in here about standing in state, but much of what he said in this chapter we just read about in the, in the other chapters that I quoted from. Uh, Just scan this quickly. He says, um, But it should now be the object of his life to be well pleasing to him in whom he is accepted. This is what Paul means when he writes, We labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. All believers are accepted in him. And this for eternity, hence it should be the object of our souls to so live that we may be daily accepted of him and well pleasing to him. This is to walk worthy of our high and holy calling, is what he says. So, I mean, again, I need to add some stuff to these quotes. The problem I have sometimes, but the thing is already, what, eight pages long, and this time we're done five minutes early. So, it's part of, part of this is somewhat me trying to juggle what's too much and what's not going too far without, you know, you know, I've never, it's never been my intention in any of this to, to, to misrepresent anybody in uh, what, they've, what they've said. Mike, you got a question? Well, I, um, how about a practical one here? Since most of evangelicalism sets Pentecost as the birth of the church, this is the good iron side here. How do we deal with with them point when they point out that obviously the dispensation changed because it's the coming of the Holy Spirit? That's very significant and so forth. And of course they're referring to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and so forth. Why isn't that the beginning of the church? For my answer to that? Yeah. Uh, how did you deal with that? I would I would deal with that along the same it's already it's, it's obvious that um, he believed that the, that the prophetic clock stopped at Calvary. Uh, don't go along with that. The reason I don't go along with that idea is because of the distinction between prophecy and mystery that he himself has already labored to convince me exists in, in, in this both of these books, in fact. So if that's true, and I go to Acts 2, and I see that everything that happens in Acts 2 is the fulfillment of prophecy, but prophecy doesn't refer to the church, then the problem is with their logic, not with mine, I, I guess would be the way I would answer it. Because they're saying that, it's, that, the, that the fulfillment of this prophecy started the church when they've already said that prophecy and mystery are different and the, you can't, no, nowhere in the Old Testament do you read anything about the mystery and the church is the subject of the mystery. Yet they want to make this the beginning of the church when it, everything that happens by, by Peter's own mouth is said to be the fulfillment of prophecy. That's, that's the way I would... That's the, and then I would go through, and more specifically, I would say, okay, what is Pentecost? Pentecost is a Jewish feast day. Who's present at Pentecost but Jews only? Who does Peter preach to specifically but the Jews only? If you read what he says here, he says that what's happening is the beginning of the last days of prophecy, not the beginning of the church, the body of Christ. So for me, there are you know three or four different ways that I would try to deal with the person uh, on that question. There were people, when I was a student like at Grace Bible College, there were a lot of denominational students that believed the church started in Acts 2, and they would raise that very point. Well, Because they, what they're told is, well, it's got to be significant, because it's the coming of the Holy Spirit. I don't disagree with that. It is significant, but it's significant not because it's the beginning of the church, but it's 
It's a new thing God's doing in, in Israel that he said he would do back in the Old Testament. Now, there's a couple of hands up, Norm and then Ronnie. Well, didn't you cover that in the book of Mark where Jesus was on the cross and he said, forgive them. Yes. So they don't know any better. And then there was an extension given. Now, certainly Christ wasn't here you know, after he ascended into heaven to fulfill it, but the Spirit was given to work during the time up until, up until the time Israel couldn't go any further. Uh, wouldn't that be... I, yes, there are a lot of things that you could bring up. I personally... Go ahead, Ronnie. I don't mean to hold the, you up. The argument that you just made that um, because the Holy Spirit outpouring was prophesied, <coughs> therefore it can't also be the Holy Spirit forming the body of Christ the argument seems flawed to me in that Jesus Christ was Israel's Messiah, and yet the same exact same person is the head of the church. So if we, if that argument, the second argument is not flawed, then the first argument that you made is flawed. The other thing, I, I hear what you're saying. The other thing is that people, mid act thinkers, make a distinction between baptism with the Spirit. That's what happens on the day of Pentecost. And baptism uh, by the Spirit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. What's going on in Acts 2 is they're being baptized with the Spirit. And it's only falling upon all those the initial group that gets the Spirit are only those that have already been water baptized according to the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? Because if you read Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says, He that believeth it... Well, I have a Bible in front of me. No sense in uh, messing it up. Acts 2.38, Then Peter said, repent, uh, said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ uh, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there's, there's, still, there's still that old order here that is being followed in Acts 2 that matches what we studied about when we went through Mark chapter 16 about the issues related to the, uh, the, God, the, 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 the so-called Great Commission. Uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. The people that received the Holy Spirit in the early on in Acts chapter 2 are the apostles and are people that have already been water baptized. And remember that God is in the process here of forming a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and the two things that have to be done for them to function in the office of a priest is to be washed with water and anointed with oil. And so I, I, I think that there are, even if you pick up uh, Mr. Stamp's commentary on the book of Acts, if you look at uh, Mr. Baker's explanation of this in the dispensational theology, all of them make a distinction between baptism with the Spirit and baptism by the Spirit as not being the same thing. And therefore, along with other arguments that I just mentioned, the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit on Acts 2 cannot be the beginning of a church. Yeah. The Ephesians, to whom the book of Ephesians was written in Acts chapter 19, actually were water baptized before they received the Holy Spirit also. Okay, so. So that argument isn't a good argument. Okay. I guess. Yeah. Well, it seems pretty clear to me that in Acts two, the, uh, the baptism there is, is Jesus is prophesied baptism. It's Christ doing the bat the baptizer. Christ is the baptizer. He's the baptizer, and he promised them, you know, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, and that's clearly prophecy. Uh, and then in First Corinthians twelve thirteen. It's the Holy Spirit that's the baptizer that's baptized us into Christ. Clearly, a different baptism. Fitting in with uh, Ephesians 4 5, with one baptism. I mean, you have to decide which one you're going to believe. Well, we are five minutes past, and we need to quit. Thanks for the, uh, in the uh, discussion. And we will resume this uh, next time. We're going to start talking about Baltimore.